So um, just the survey before I start with my thing, if you could be as good as to please take that survey afterwards. That information is valuable to IOPSA. Okay. You know, when we do these webinars, you know, the guys behind the scenes getting it, uh, we see some numbers, you know, if I look at it climbing as it goes now. But um, what we sometimes don't realize is the impact and the, and the proactiveness of some individuals. And I received a call uh, last week um, from Don Anthony down in, in the Cape. He's a training provider down in the Cape. And what was interesting is that, you know, his students come in early on a, on a Monday and Thursday specifically to the to attend the webinars and have their discussions and everything else, which I think is really great in terms of, of the impact that we have and you know being proactive in terms of individuals. I know there are companies out there that do the same. So I just want to say thank you very much to Don for being proactive and also to those companies that have their staff in the rooms that uh, uh, have these webinars there, have the discussions and learn. So just from my side and from IOPS and PILB to Don, just, and the students, well done. Thank you very much for being so proactive. Thanks very much, Steve. And uh, thanks always for the opportunity to talk to the guys. We're lucky to be able to talk to you. What we're going to talk about today and go quickly through is something most of you probably know a whole lot about. So I might tell you a whole bunch of stuff you already know. But um, I'll go through it from, from our perspective as a manufacturer. There might be one or two things you pick up, and then most certainly afterwards, if there's some questions, we'll tackle them. So I'm going to talk about flush masters, these good old ugly things which flush toilets and urinals. Um, okay, just a quick little punt from our side. Remember that these things are made here in South Africa, and when you're buying these South African products, you're obviously supporting South African industry. All right. So what we'll first do is explain what it is, then show you how they work. Uh, they, they are quite specific in the installation requirements, so you can't just pluck it onto the end of any half-inch pipe and hope that it will work. Um, there are pressure and size requirements, so we'll talk about that, and uh, then just a little bit of the support spares and backup. So I'm going to use a, a cut-through section of a junior flash master to explain the operation and the principle of how it works. Uh, both the standard and the junior work on the same principle. So they're obviously um, different uh, in, in construction because the one is on low pressure and the other is on high, but the principle of how they work is the same. So in this drawing, it's going to be a bit difficult to see. So in the next slide, I've got it really simplified in a, in a bit more diagrammatic. But essentially what I want you to just remember is that you've got your Inlet here, so that would be where your, where your incoming water is, and that's where the, the, the outlet is going to the flash pipe. And you'll see from the inlet that you've got this rubber diaphragm. If you see that thing outside, that's that little piston FJ810, and it divides that valve into two chambers, one below the diaphragm and one above the diaphragm. And, and where you can see it right now in this picture, you can see that that diaphragm is pressed hard closed on that seat. So no water can get down through that flashing tube. So let's go and have a look at it here. So there, there you can see a little cut through of a junior. And if we start here in the closed position, you'll see that the diaphragm, the surface area on the diaphragm is marginally bigger on top than it is underneath because that, that uh, piston top is, is inset. So although your pressure either side of the diaphragm is exactly the same, because the surface area on top is bigger, the downward force is greater than the upward force. So in this position, that, that water pressure, the incoming water pressure is pushing that diaphragm closed onto the seat and there's no water flowing. The next thing that happens is you tilt, uh, when, when you push the button, you tilt that little, um, relief seat and uh, so that's inside that little black piston some of you will probably know and the my mouse keeps disappearing okay the water a little bit of water from the top runs through the middle of the valve through the, the the that relief seat and in so doing the pressure on top becomes less than the pressure underneath 
So, so what happens then is that the incoming water pressure is able to push that diaphragm up, and in so doing, it clears the flush seat, and and the water runs through, and that's where you get your flush. So you're now at a full open flow, and the water is busy flushing. At the same time as it's doing it, it's going through this little bypass hole. So you see there's a little bypass hole in that diaphragm. It's quite small. So the water, the rate that it goes through that hole is less than the rate that it's coming out the flush tube. But as it does it, it starts to fill up the top chamber until it's filled up and the pressure on top then becomes greater than the pressure underneath and it closes. So it, it goes through the flush cycle. So it's really a very basic, simple thing. Um, I can also just point out here, you see that there's a little offset cam on that on that uh, push button. And the the time adjustment is done simply by tilting that, that that cam to the top or the bottom. So obviously if it's at the top, when you when you push it, you're gonna get a bigger arc, which will make a bigger clearing, which will let more water out and take longer to fill. So when that little offset cam is facing the top, that's when you're gonna get a longer flash. And and so as you turn it going down, you will you will reduce the flash time. But we'll come back to that for questions. Uh, at the end, if you want to talk about that. All right. As far as the, um, the installation requirements go, I'm just keeping an eye on the time at the same. A standard flush master or a senior, as some of you might know it, is a big, chunky, ugly old thing. And it was made really to suit low pressure systems. So you'll you'll remember some of the older guys Buildings had to have storage tanks. Public buildings had to have storage tanks. And some of the old British plumbing was based on gravity-fed systems. So if you had a tank uh, that was only a few meters above the above the draw-off point, you didn't have much pressure. And so if you had to take that low pressure through a little three-quarter pipe, you definitely were not going to get a result. So although you had low pressure, you needed something that which would still give you big volume. So that's why this is such a big chunky thing. So your your inlet size is inch and a quarter, 35 mil copper pipe, if you like, and your your required pressure would be 30 kPa or three meters. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. At peak flow, that thing is flowing at 105 liters a minute. So it's obviously not going to flow for a whole minute. So you're not going to get 105 liters, but it's absolutely dependent on large volume. So if you went and took a three-quarter pipe from a three-meter tank to that thing, it's not going to work. The junior flush master, by contrast, is is um, uh, dependent on pressure. So you need a, a dynamic pressure or inlet flow pressure of 150 kPa. So obviously you need mains pressure. So you know it will work anything up to six, seven, eight hundred kPa. More than that, you start to get a percussive close. But because you've got pressure. You can you can work with a small, a relatively small three quarter inch pipe, and that peak flow is 65 liters a minute. So in both cases, it'll flow for enough time to clear the pan. And if you you think of flushing a standard flush master in a hospital or something, it's like a slow umpa lumpa, quiet flush. It's quite long. Just a point of note: the toilet valve and the urinal valve of the junior. Uh, essentially look exactly the same from the outside. And um, the junior valve for the urinal, it, because it's delivering such a little water to a urine, urinal, um, it doesn't actually need, it'll, it actually would work from a half inch pipe if need be, and it, would, it will work with as little as 30 kPa pressure, only for a urinal. So in fact, a urinal valve could be supplied by a tank and it will still, at above 30 kPa, it will still properly close and flash. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into great detail about mobile flow rate, but um, in terms of pipe sizing, at some point I've got a really nice talk on pipe sizing, and we can go into detail about that. But when you have banks of these things, uh, you know, you think of public ablution blocks and areas like that, you, you probably need some guidance for the pipe sizing because, you again, you can't just take one random size pipe and hope everything will work. It won't if you don't get it right. Okay, quickly on pressure, you guys have probably covered this a million times, but um, 
essentially you would get to pressure in two ways. Uh, the, so the one is that that pressure is force over area, and we know that the force would be uh, mass times acceleration. So it would be the weight of the water be driven by gravi gravity, and um, the other way is is pressure times density times is the height times density times times gravity. So in both little equations here, you would see you get to the exact same result. And for us, as a rule of thumb, the very simple thing to say is for every meter of head of water we've got, you will essentially have 10 kp of pressure. So if you had a 10 meter high column of water like that, it would measure 100 kp at the bottom. It would actually be 98.1, but it's good enough to, to multiply by 10. So the reason that we talk about that in this context is that if you had a three meter high tank, you would have 30 kpa. If you had a two meter high tank, you wouldn't have enough because you'd only have 20 kpa. And in fact, 30 would be borderline because that would leave you absolutely no margin for friction loss. Once again, uh, you know, at a later point, we can go into a lot of detail about that. Okay, the difference between uh, pressure, static pressure, and dynamic pressure. In this slide, what I really just wanted to show is that Static pressure is a potential energy. It's like having a, let's say, a 12 volt battery. It's a 12 volt battery, but it hasn't done anything. It's it's got the capability to do something, but nothing's happened. When the current starts moving, or when the water starts moving, that's when when you'll get flow. So so what we're trying to illustrate here is that potential energy. It's just purely you put a gauge on, and you can see that you've got in this case 680 kPa. But it doesn't mean a thing. Once that water's flowing, you could then have a rate of flow. When when your customers say my pressure in the shower is not great, or what they're really meaning is that their flow rate is not great. And the flow rate is a result of the static pressure less the friction that it encounters on its way there. And that's where your pipe sizing and all that type of thing comes into. It. And in flash master installations, um, it's a it's a critical factor. So you guys know you can you can get to a thing with an undersized pipe or, or inadequate pressure, and then the damn thing doesn't work. And in terms of pipe sizing, they're obviously not really efficient these days because a system really the the smaller the pipe, the longer it'll take to fill up. But it won't not work when it flashes. So we recognise and acknowledge that there's a, a move towards concealed systems and electronic products and so on. But most definitely as a plumber, when you're maintaining these things or installing them, if they're specified in a project, you've got to get the pipe sizing right. Okay. Again, I'm not going to go into all that detail, but when, you, when you're when working out the pipe sizing, the, the key factors you would need to know, how am I doing for time? Yeah, I've got five minutes. You've got to know what type of building it is because that will give you the probable flow. Um, the example I would use, if you had a, five bedroom fancy house or five bathroom fancy house the odds of all five things being flashed at the same time are not great maybe two will happen at the same time you know whereas if you had a uh, hundred flash masters at a rugby stadium and the halftime whistle went the odds of five or ten or twenty of them being used at the same time are really good because everybody's had three scoops in the first half and then need to go for a leak so Probable required flow comes from tables. In your SABS tables and things like that, you'll also find it. And again, uh, i just remind, I can give a really nice talk on that detail at a later point. But the first thing is to know what type of building. Uh, then you need to know what your available pressure is. So, you know, you would take that from, in this case, it's a junior flash master. So from your mains, you'd go and take a pressure reading on the site. Then you 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 know that your required pressure, uh, your required flow pressure in this case is 150 kPa because it's a junior. Your loss of head, remember you gain pressure coming down. So if you go up, you lose pressure. So if we now climbing up six meters here, of that 680 kPa, we're going to lose 60 k of, uh, 60 kPa of static pressure. Okay, so we'd have the 620. Oh, and you must work out where's your critical point. Where's the furthest point? The furthest and highest point away works, then you know everything else will work. So your friction loss is determined by 
taking your available pressure, so your 620 kPa, less what you need, 150, and you take the balance of that divided by your critical, uh, your distance to critical point, and that will tell you how many kPa per meter you can afford to lose, and then you would apply that when you look at the tables for friction loss. And again, we can really, really explain that very nicely at some later stage. Okay. On a standard flash master, the same, same things apply, except this time you would typically be coming from a tank, and your critical point would be where the pressure is the lowest. So if you took the four meters from the, from the water in that tank to the inlet of that, that would be, if that one works, you know, this one works, uh, then they'll all work because as you go down your pressure, pressure here would be 40 kPa, 70 kPa, 110 kPa. So your critical distance is still the furthest one, but your critical pressure would be this one at 40 kPa. And, you know, in this case, you're going to end up with much bigger pipes because they're standard flash masters and the required flow rate on those probability tables is going to be a lot higher. All right. So, um, that I hope you covered just very briefly how they work and the, some of the factors you need to consider when, when working out pipe sizing. Um, and you know, when, the, when, when you guys will have us, I'll give a really detailed uh, pipe sizing talk. And in fact, that's the thing we we'll probably need to spread, spread over a few, a few sessions because it's quite complex, but it's, it's really good to know. Um, what I really wanted to show here is the availability of spares. So these products have been around for donkey's years. Um, you really can get all the bits and pieces. You guys as plumbers will have found you come across an old dinosaur like this that's been in store for 30 years and you can still service it. You can change the top cover, change the piston, change the, the um, push button or the, or the flashing lever. And uh, they they work remarkably well, and they've stood up to major abuse in you know public areas and stuff. Um, always with Cobra products made of DZR brass, which we've spoken about many times. So by now you understand what that is. And remember that from from our side at, at Lickthill, we've got uh, Cobra Assist National Network of of uh, technical guys who can help you both on site. We've got either warranty issues, problems, typical thing you get, you know, you install a junior urinal valve uh, and you've just finished the job and then the guy phones and says the thing's not shutting off. We know every time you're going to go back there, open the, open the thing up, take a piston out and find little bits of swarf and grit and stuff because on a urinal valve, um, that area between the piston screw and the flashing tube is much narrower for the lower, so it's sensitive to do it. Take a dirt out, the thing works perfectly. But remember, you've got our, our support and backup. And uh, what we're also really trying to do through the merchant network is make our presence more prominent so that you can see which guy is a real authorized spares dealer and keeps, keeps, the, um, keeps the venue and stuff. So I think that I'm spot on time-wise. Thanks very much for the listen. Um, and we ask you to please support South African industry to help our ailing economy. Uh, thanks very much, guys. Thank you very much for the intro, and thank you to Robbie for uh, doing our presentation today. I'm sure we're going to get a huge amount of value out of uh, the presentation.